Let's look at the top five ways Islam is the cleanest religion ever. Number five. Narrated Baraita, the Prophet sent Ali to Khalid to bring the Qumas, a portion of the war booty, and I hated Ali, and Ali had taken a bath after a sexual act with a slave girl from the war booty. When we reached the Prophet, I mentioned that to him. He said, O Baraita, do you hate Ali? I said, yes. He said, do not hate him, for he deserves more than that from the Qumas. Notice Ali's priorities. He had been sent by Muhammad himself to bring back a share of the war booty, and Ali's return trip was delayed for a sexual act with a captive woman. Now, you would think that Ali would then hurry back to Muhammad, trying to make up for lost time, but no, Ali took the time to bathe himself. One wonders if a woman who had just been through battle would be in the mood for consensual sexual intercourse by one of her captors. Perhaps this was the source of Boraida's objection. But for all of Ali's shortcomings, he did take a bath after. Number four. Malik was asked whether a man who had women and slave girls could have intercourse with all of them before he did ghusl, or the ritual purification. He said, there is no harm in a man having intercourse with two of his slave girls before he does ghusl. It is disapproved of, however, to go to a free woman on another's day. There is no harm in making love first to one slave girl and then to another when one is jinnab or impure due to sexual intercourse. Here, the 8th century jurist Malik ibn Anas lays out the purification requirements for having intercourse with multiple slave girls. Not only is it permissible to have intercourse with slave girls in Islam in general, but it's permissible to go from one to the other without stopping to bathe in between, though clearly bathing at some point is in view. Again, we see sexual immorality side by side with concerns about ritual bathing. Number three, it was narrated from Abu Rafi that the prophet went around to all of his wives in one night, and he had a bath after each one of them. It was said to him, O Messenger of Allah, why not make it one bath? He said, this is pure, better, cleaner. Notice Muhammad's example. He has several wives, he has sex with all of them in one night, but he takes a bath in between, sometimes. In other cases, he would go around with all of his wives in one night with a single bath. Note that Muhammad was concerned about his external purity. He took a bath after each sexual act. However, if you only have one bath available, then don't let that interrupt your mattress marathon. How would you like to be that last woman right before Muhammad crossed the finish line? Now, you may say, we know from common sense, to be perfectly honest, that going from one wife to the other without a bath is not sanitary much less when you have about nine wives. I would also argue that it's not sanitary in spite of the fact that Muhammad said several times that believers do not become sexually impure. It's difficult to understand what Muhammad meant by this since we can look at studies on sexually transmitted diseases in Muslim-majority countries. Although the data is very limited since Muslim countries aren't forthcoming with much of anything, especially this type of data, in a five-year study of sexually transmitted infections in Saudi Arabia, a total of about 39,000 cases were reported, and there's a breakdown of the various types of infections if you're curious. So it seems that Muslims do become impure. Now, wouldn't it have been better for Muhammad to just have waited until he could be more clean about it, rather than just having sex with all of his wives with only one bath? Maybe, but he did take a bath after, which once again gives us an example of a concern for external cleanliness juxtaposed with repulsive sexual behavior. Number two, Muhammad was the cleanest prophet ever, thanks to his child bride, who would scrape the semen off of his clothes with her fingernails before he went for prayer. Now this really makes one wonder, where did all of this male reproductive fluid come from, and why was it all over his clothes? But just when you think it can't get any worse, we get to number one. Sharia law is so concerned about cleanliness, it even takes into account young girls who have not yet reached sexual maturity. When a woman who has been made love to performs the purificatory bath, and the male's sperm afterwards leaves her vagina, then she must repeat the bathing if two conditions exist. That she is not a child, but rather old enough to have sexual gratification, as it might otherwise be solely her husband's sperm, and that she was fulfilling her sexual urge with the lovemaking, not sleeping or forced. If the male sperm leaves a little girl after she's completed purification, then she doesn't need to repeat the purification because she's not old enough to have sexual gratification and the sexual fluid that results from it. Problem solved. 
Shirilaw is so concerned about external cleanliness that it even goes into this level of detail. All of these examples show us depraved people who are also concerned with external purity. Ali was having sex with a captive woman. That was most plausibly what any reasonable person would consider rape, given the circumstances. Yet Ali is portrayed as purifying himself after the fact, for what that's worth. Malik ibn Anas went as far as to say that no purification is required between sexual acts with slave girls. Muhammad would have intercourse with all of his wives without stopping for a bath, and frequently had male reproductive fluid on his clothes, which his child bride would scrape off so he could go to the mosque nice and clean. Regardless of what Muhammad did the night before, he was apparently clean when he went for prayer. Sharia law, likewise, is so concerned about cleanliness that it even contains bathing guidelines for intercourse with girls who aren't sexually mature. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Read the requirements specific to bathing and purification in the Muslim sources. They are exhaustively detailed. Islam is clearly concerned about the external self. And of course this is true not only with ritual purification, but with external appearance in general. How do you dress? How long is your beard? What color is your burqa? But Islam is a man-made religion, and by definition, all of its numerous requirements for external appearance and purity serve very little purpose other than to give the illusion of piety. However, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And this is one of Islam's most drastic shortcomings. It has no remedy for the heart and for problems like humanity's sinful nature and separation from God, so we see Islam compensating in other ways, like ritual purity. Yet, when we can look at these obligations for external cleanliness, whether they're in the text as requirements or being given to us in the form of examples set by Muhammad and the companions, we can easily tell there is a serious problem because these requirements concerned with external cleanliness are side by side with depraved sexual behavior. Requirements for the external person are given detailed attention in Islam. The inner person that God looks at is left unattended. This is yet another reason Islam cannot do a thing to make a person right with the true God.